Okay, so before we get into uh, sewer design, let's just uh, refresh our memory about a few announcements. Um, on Wednesday, because they're having a research conference in this building on Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, our class will meet in the hydraulics lab on Wednesday. So that's just down the hall, room 1228. Um, and then the homework assignment you've got right now is due on Friday, and Friday's class will be online. And you know what announcement isn't on there is the announcement about your project, because you've submitted that, right? It's all done. So now that's a big to-do item on my list, is to go through and check out those projects. Hopefully, uh, hopefully they're good, because I like giving out high grades on the projects, and I'm sure that you probably had a busy weekend putting all that together. So, any questions on the announcements before we begin? The last class you had stuff about the final. Mm -hmm. Did we get a one page? What? Did we get a one page? Hmm, I'll have to think through that because I already give you a formula sheet in this class, right? I'll have to think about it. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I haven't yet decided what the parameters for the final exam is going to be, but we've still got some time because our final in this class is on Friday of finals. So I'll let you know on Wednesday. All right. So as I mentioned a few minutes ago, what we're talking about is flow through a pipe, but it's not pressurized flow. It's gravity flow through a pipe. And... Um, so the hydraulics that we'll be talking about today are applicable to sanitary sewers and also to storm sewers. Um, in some places they have both of those water sources going through the same pipe, like Huntington is unique because we have throughout the city of Huntington some places where it's a combined sanitary and storm sewer. There's other parts of the city that are a little bit newer that have separate storm sewer and separate sanitary sewer. So then that means that there's three different ki kinds of pipes in some locations. There's the combined, the sanitary, and the storm. Um, a sanitary sewer is going to be taking wastewater from where it's generated, usually meaning like people's homes or businesses, to a central location. So this is the opposite of um, the pipe flow project that you just did where it's drinking water distribution that's coming from one central location and then dendritically outward to many different destinations. So sewers, the opposite direction. It's coming from many locations and then it's tapering down into relatively fewer trunk line pipes and then finally to a single uh, point of collection and treatment. And um, it's open channel flow, meaning that uh, the pipe has to be sloped in order for the water to move without any pumps required. There are some places where they have pressurized wastewater flow, but it's usually uh, lift stations where um, in a really flat town that doesn't have a natural slope to it, they still have to have the sewer pipes at an angle, but eventually they're so deep that then they have to lift the water back up with a pump and then it flows by gravity again. Um, service connections are the individual homes and businesses that are connected to the network. And just for some terminology here, a manhole is the fixed points along the network where there's a point of access that someone could climb down and maintain or observe and inspect the pipe to look for things like cracks in the pipe or root intrusion. And it's these pump stations that are responsible for lifting the flow to higher elevations when that's necessary. Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Uh, here in Huntington, we do have a couple of lift stations that are in the vicinity of the treatment plant itself, just where they're trying to get it up to a higher elevation closer to the tanks where the water is collected at the treatment plant. Now, when we are designing the pipes, for a sewer, we have to, number one, try and figure out what kind of flow it's likely to carry. And so remember that in the project you've just done, the first phase of that project was demand estimation. And that's also the same first step in trying to figure out how big sewer pipes should be, is estimating what the flow or flows are going to be through that pipe. And a typical design life would be you're assuming that the pipes would be in the ground for 50 years before they're rehabilitated.
but there are plenty of locations where pipes that are 100 years old are still in operation. So it's best to be conservative when you're sizing the pipe and uh, think about what wastewater will be generated at the end of the design life. And so you don't want to make the mistake that too many towns across America have made and they'll size the pipe for the number of people that are in the town today. But if the town continues to grow, then very quickly you can exhaust the capacity of the pipe and suddenly you've got more wastewater than you can handle through the pipes. And it's very expensive to come back through and excavate them and replace them with larger pipes. And so it's, it's the best approach, obviously, just to get it right the first time. Um, and as you might expect, just like there was variation in flow demand in your project where people are consuming more water in the evening than they are in the middle of the night because of clothes washing and uh, washing dishes and you know, people drawing baths and all that, um, sewer use and the production of wastewater mimics the demand for water. And so there's going to be a variation where there's peak times that the water's coming into the uh, into the network and other times in the middle of the night where the flow is really low and that's actually a problem for uh, sewers that um, if the water is moving very slowly through the pipe then solids that would otherwise be suspended can settle out and can begin to uh, clog the bottom of the pipe and so we'll talk about both the minimum flow rate and minimum velocity through the pipe, but then also the maximum flow rate that's going to be going through the pipe. So the point is, is that it's not steady flow through sewer pipes. There's variations through the day. Um, and now contributing to the complexity of trying to figure out how much water is going to be going through a sewer pipe, you also have to think about whether water is going to be getting into the pipe during rainy periods. And so we've got a rainy day today and a sewer pipe is, if it's a strictly a sanitary sewer, is really only supposed to be carrying water that is coming from homes and businesses. But when a concrete pipe is set with uh, not a lot of care and attention to the, uh, the sub-base that it's set on, if, if there's some differential settlement where maybe the soil settles on one part of the pipe but not on the other, then the concrete pipe can crack and now even though the pipe is mostly still together, just a small crack in the concrete pipe now means that groundwater can get into the sewer pipe. And so when there's rainy weather and the, um, the water table increases, then water can seep into, uh, into pipes during wet weather. And so um, infiltration is the groundwater that can get into sewer systems and inflow would be illegal connections, roof drains that maybe are connected in a combined sewer that's, uh, that's connected in. And so they call this, this combined infiltration and inflow, it's often just referred to as an I and I. And so you have to account for not only the capacity of the pipe for the sewage that'll be generated and not only just the average daily flow, you wanna think about what's the peak flow because if you're only sizing the pipe for the average daily flow, then several times per week, it's likely that uh, there could be more water needing to get into the pipes than available capacity. So it's not only you know, the legitimate water that's going to be in the pipe that you should plan for, but also the infiltration and inflow. And so here's just an image that shows water that's coming into a cracked pipe. You can see it's just trickling in from above because it's a concrete pipe that's going through um, an area where the water table is above the pipe itself. And so any crack is going to have the water seeping in. Now conversely, the other thing that's bad about cracks in pipes is that the wastewater can get out. And so um, you know that can cause pollution and contamination of the groundwater. So it's just you know really important when sewers are being put into place that um, there isn't going to be this differential sediment that would cause the pipes to crack. Now this is a drain from a uh, commercial building. This, uh, the gutter, rather than going out onto the sidewalk, it just, it seems to vanish down into the ground. But really what it's doing is it's going down into the ground and then connecting to a sewer pipe. Um, so how much capacity you plan on is sometimes up to the engineer to you know, make reasonable assumptions about 
how much wastewater is going to be generated, but sometimes it's just a matter of code or a public ordinance, how much capacity you need to plan for if you're putting in a neighborhood, for example. Uh, the developer would know how big the pipe ought to be by estimating the number of people that would live in the development and then multiplying it by this flow rate factor. And it's interesting if you compare different locations how much variation there is in their published codes on the amount of wastewater that you should expect from person to person. So for instance, the city of Berkeley, California mandates that you would uh, plan on 350 liters per person per day. Uh, but Milwaukee has a, uh, an estimate mandate of 1,000 liters per person per day. And they say that on top of that, you need to plan for additional flows due to I and I. So it can really vary widely. And uh, so it, it won't sometimes be up to the individual designer to generate the, uh, the flow rate assumption factor. But you will still have to think carefully about how many people are likely to be in an area that's serviced by the sewer lines you're putting in. And then think also about the variation over time. Um, here's just some data that has typical population density for different types of zoning. And then, of course, you know if you have an area that's being developed, an area being developed and you multiply it by a, a density factor, that would give you the number of people. Then you'd multiply it by one of these factors, and then that gives you the number of liters per day. That's the average flow. Um, commercial situation is pretty much similar in that there are local ordinances that give you some sort of prescriptive um, assumption for how much water you should plan on entering the sewer pipes based on per hectare of developed land or per person that's uh, uh, occupying an office building. So this is just all about trying to figure out how much water is going to be generated. But it's important to note that some industrial facilities have their own uh, water treatment and uh, discharge systems. And so there can be uh, resorts or hotels that have their own treatment plants. Oftentimes, um, industrial facilities like um, Huntington Steel, I believe, has their own wastewater collection system. And so if they have an on-site facility, then you wouldn't necessarily have to plan on the same volume in your municipal uh, network to receive their wastewater. Now, peaking factors is a term that you're familiar with from the project you've just completed. This idea that the amount of water during some design condition is going to be higher than the rate that's coming into the network on the average day. And so uh, there are empirical peaking factors that try and suggest what the peak flow rate would be on the basis of populations. Now, this is kind of interesting. If you're trying to predict the peak flow rate compared to the average flow rate. So let's say, you know, just algebraically, if you move this from the denominator to the right-hand side of the equation, what it's saying is that the peak flow rate is going to be 5.5 times the average flow rate, but then divided by the population in thousands to the 0.18 power. So what that says is that if you have a small population, there's going to be more variability than if you've got a large population. Um, and there's some logic to that. If you think about why would there be like a more extreme peak for a small town than a large town? Um, in part, it's because in a large town, you're more likely to have economic diversity where people are starting jobs at different times of the day compared to a smaller town where maybe a greater fraction of the population works at the same place and is on the same working schedule. Um, but also, if you've got a small population, it's likely that they're close together. And part of the, the danger with peaking is if the wastewater arrives at the same location at the same time, then that can uh, uh, be too much for the pipe to handle in any given moment. But if the population is spread out over a large area, even if everyone flushes their toilet at the same time, the fact that some people are far away and some people are close 
means that the water has different travel times before it gets to a, single, a certain pipe in the network. And so they call that effect routing, the, the transit time that water has to take as it flows through a network. So these population-based empirical peaking factors are using kind of those two uh, trends to justify the idea that you could predict how big a peaking factor ought to be used by whether it's a small town versus a big town, is bigger towns just are more constant. In New York, they say, is the city that never sleeps. And so if some people are always awake and we're not all on that same nine to five cycle of working and eating in the evenings and that sort of thing, if there's more variability, then the water use patterns are more variable from person to person and then there's less of a need for peaking. So let me pause for a second and just give you a chance to try out these peaking factors. Let's say that we have a 17.5 hectare condominium development that's being planned in an area where the water use is 350 liters per person per day. And what we'll assume here is that all of that water gets back down into the sewer. So the water use and the wastewater generation is going to be one and the same in this example. So if the, uh, if the average is 350 liters per person per day, then number one, let's figure out how many people there are because we want to know on an absolute basis how many cubic meters per day is going to be used. But let's find both the average water use per day, but then also the minimum and the maximum flow rates during the day by using these peaking factors. Okay, so you can see on the whiteboard we've calculated the number of people in this development. Uh, 2187.5 people. And there's not really half a person there, but I guess maybe that would be a small person but uh, who isn't using as much water necessarily. But uh, if we multiply that by the per capita use, then it looks like there's going to be 765 cubic meters per day on an average daily need. Um, but now, if we find the peak, then we have to put the population in thousands into the denominator there, take it to the 0.18 power. So this is going to peak pretty heavily from the baseline of 765 cubic meters per day. The peak flow into the system will be 3655 cubic meters per day. And then the minimum is likewise pretty extreme. We're going to be multiplying it by 0.2 times the population in thousands to the 0.16 power for this minimum empirical function. And so that would be 173 cubic meters per day for the minimum flow rate. So what we would do is we would size the network so that it can handle 3655 cubic meters per day and then once we figured out the pipe size needed to convey this flow, then we're going to check and see what do the hydraulics look like when there's only 173 going through that pipe. We'll want to know what's the flow velocity because what we'd prefer is it stays above some minimum to ensure self-cleansing in the pipe. So are there any questions on uh, the calculations here for this example before we move on? Oh, okay. This is one of my favorite videos of all time. You're so fortunate. We're all so fortunate that uh, there was a camera pointed on one rainy night at this highway location. This is back in 1999, so I'll apologize for the quality of the image. It's not real clear. But what it lacks in clarity, it makes up for in, I don't know, excitement. Okay, so this is just a rainy day, and uh, here's a bridge. There's going to be cars going both directions, and here is where uh, water is supposed to go into um, a, uh, a storm sewer. And you notice I said it where water is supposed to go in. So let's just take a look at some non-uniform flow. Yeah, 
Yeah, a car just drove into that. Yeah. The fact that they've got a camera pointed at this location suggests it's maybe not the first time it's happened. There's lightning. And uh, the lid for this, it got blown off. So, you know, the car that was driving into that uh, kind of got plastered by the manhole cover. So this isn't too much longer, but of course the fella gets out of the car as you do after an accident. So, you know, like you have to ask why did that happen? Um, oh, he's walking away. Run! <laughs> All right. So, running now. <laughs> okay. Poor guy. We're laughing at his misery. <laughs> you got to laugh or you'll cry. Right? So, the, uh, the pipe capacity was less than the uh, demand. There was more water going into that sewer than, si than, than available size. And it may just be a brief moment in time when flow from a couple of adjacent lateral networks uh, came at a certain instant and caused it to clog like that. But, um, you know, it's a pretty spectacular result. So the main point is that um, sewers very rarely are flowing at their full capacity. And so most of the time, the water is going to be only full to a certain depth in there. Now, the, uh, the geometry of this is really complicated trying to find the depth of flow in a circular pipe of a given diameter. And so uh, it's going to make even something as simple as Manning's equation pretty tricky for us because um, the, uh, the cross-sectional area, the wetted, the wetted perimeter, the depth of flow, all of these things are a function of the angle that the water surface makes with the center of the pipe. And so here theta is the angle that would be traced if you were to draw a line from the, the center of area of the pipe, so just the center here, down to the water line on both sides. So, and theta is in radians. So if the water was halfway full, then theta would be 3.14, right? And if the water's all the way up to the top, then theta would be 2 pi radians if the, if the water's just almost to the very top. So um, we can also find the, uh, the top width of flow because some of the equations we use in hydraulics require us to describe the top width of flow, uh, uppercase b. Um, so here's Manning's equation, which we know and love and have used on lots of previous uh, occasions. And, if you substitute these terms in for the hydraulic flow of a partially full pipe into Manning's equation, then this is what you get in terms of theta, the angle that the water is making. And um, the thing that complicates this even a little bit further here is that N, the roughness factor for a pipe, um, you'll remember that in the closed conduit section of the course, we spent a lot of time calculating the correct F that should, should be applied for a given situation. You know, the friction factor for Darcy's equation varies based on the flow conditions. But I told you back then that what, one of the things we like about the Hayes and Williams equation and Manning's equation is that those, are fri those friction factors are fixed, that they don't vary based on the flow rate or the water temperature. But the one exception to that is partially full flow hydraulics, you do have to adjust the end value. And so um, I'm going to illustrate how we can apply all of these different, um, all these different uh, considerations together at the same time to find out, for example, for a given flow rate, how deep will the water be? Or if we know H, if we know the water depth from that, can we determine what is the flow rate? Um, but one of the corrections we're going to be making 
is that the n value varies based on the depth. And so this figure is a really important one. This is, happens to be from the FE reference manual, this figure. Um, what it shows you is that there's a nonlinear effect as the uh, water depth is decreasing, the n value is changing as well. So let's just look at this, um, this curve that's on the, the vertical axis is saying the depth of water relative to the diameter of the pipe. So when the water's all the way up at the top, y to d is 1. And so when y to d is 1, then the ratio of Manning's to Manning's n when it's full is 1. So this across the top is the uh, ratio of n to n full. But then when the water isn't all the way up to the top, what this is saying is that the n value is actually higher than if it is to the top. So like if it's halfway full, for example, if the water is only halfway full, so then the depth to diameter ratio would be 0.5. And if we go onto the curve and then up, then it's about 1.25 for the ratio of the n value to n full. And the reason for that is just think about the ratio of wetted perimeter to the area. That there's proportionally more wetted perimeter than, uh, than area when it's only partially full. So it's just that there's more of a resistance effect than there would be when the pipe is completely full. So we have to adjust for the, the roughness factor n if it's anything other than completely full. Um, okay, so just to work through some of the ways that we can handle this, there's two approaches we're going to look at. Let's consider the case of a pipe that's made out of concrete. Now, if, if the water was flowing through that concrete pipe all the way, if it was to the top, then the n value that we'd use for concrete is 0.013. Um, but it's only flowing 9 inches deep. So it's flowing 9 inches out of 24. So we're going to have to adjust and find the modified n value. And uh, we've been given the slope. And so we'll use this nomograph in part one of our calculations to find out what's the full flow rate, just using the ordinary um, Manning's equation. But then uh, we'll adjust after finding that full flow rate. We'll find out what is the flow rate when the water is 9 inches deep by using this Q to Q full nomograph. So this curve, just like the Manning's curve, this curve also tells you if you've calculated the flow rate, assuming it's full, how you can adjust for it if it's just some fraction of it full. So in our case, it's 9 inches out of 24, which, uh, let's see, as a fraction, that is 0.375. So we're going to be about at this point, and we're going to be using the ratio of Q to Q full after we found the, the Q when it is full. All right, so let's just start with uh, the case of if it is full. Let me put some of these variables on the whiteboard and then ask you to calculate them. Calculate the flow rate. All right, so uh, our diameter of 24 inches, that's the same as two feet. And the depth of flow is 9 inches. That's the same as 0 0.75 feet. And our n full, meaning if the pipe was flowing full, then the n value for roughness would be 0 0.13, 0 0.013. And the slope of the pipe is 0 0.005. OK, so if we're going to find the q full, then we need to have 1.49 times the area to the 5 thirds power, the slope to the 1 half power, divided by n times p to the 2 thirds power. Okay, so what you need to calculate is the area 
the wetted perimeter, so area is just going to be pi d squared divided by 4. The wetted perimeter is pi d. And then we can substitute that into here. And we're going to use the n value assuming it's full. So we'll use the n value of um, 0 0.013. So calculate the area when it's full. Using this d, calculate the wetted perimeter when it's full, assuming the diameter of two feet. And we want to find out what's the flow rate when the pipe is full. I'll OK. Um, now let's look at these first calculations. As I was circulating around, I saw that uh, most of you had 16.04 cubic feet per second for the flow rate if the pipe is full. So that's just assuming that the water's all the way to the top of this 24-inch diameter pipe. Uh, now, the nomograph says that if we have a 0.375 y to d, let me go to the nomograph. So it's hard to be accurate with this. So Let's just say 0.375 is the y to d. So that here's 0 0.3, 0 0.375, and then over then the point of intersection with this curve and down. What I said was, uh, you can see 0.24 was my estimate of q to q full. And so we multiply that by assuming the, flow, the full flow rate. Then what that says is that the partial depth, if it's flowing at a depth of 9 inches, then the flow rate would be 3.85 cubic feet per second at that depth of 9 inches. So one way you can solve it is just assume it's full and then multiply it by the q to q full ratio from the nomograph. Any questions about that first approach? All right. Now, the other approach is for us to calculate the angles. So to use the 9 inches that's described here to find out what is the angle. So here in red, you can see that I've highlighted the formula that we'd use to find out theta. Now, before we even calculate theta, let's just know in our minds that it's less than 3.14, right? Because if it was halfway full, then the angle would be uh, 3.14, since that's 1 pi radian. But if it's below the midpoint, which here it is, because it's 9 inches full out of 24, so we should be expecting that the angle is less than 3.14. So the formula for it, uh, cosine to the negative 1 power on my calculator, that's abbreviated. It's called ACOS. Let me write this on the board at first, and then I'll bring it up onto the recording in a moment. OK, so the, uh, the angle is going to be 2 times ACOS, inverse cosine, 1 minus 2 times 9 divided by 24. OK, so uh, the inside of the parentheses there, if we have 1 minus 2 times 9 is 18. So 1 minus 18 divided by 24 then that is going to be um, 0 0.25. That's kind of the result of what's inside the parentheses. And so then uh, the inverse cosine of 0 0.25 is 1.318 radians. So then the angle is 2.636 radians. 
Okay, so that is the angle, which is less than the 3.1, we would say it is if it's halfway full. Okay, now, now that we know the angle, we can substitute the theta into this formula for the area and the wetted perimeter, and then put those into Manning's equation. And since we're running low on time, let me just cut to the chase and show you that. Okay, so this first part is where we were calculating the angle, 2.636 radians. And then once we know the angle, we substitute it into the formula for the area. So this suggests that the area, when it's 9 inches deep, would be 1.076 square feet. That's my mistake for not saying feet squared, because it is square feet. Uh, the wedded perimeter, again, is a function of the angle in radians. And so 2.636 feet is the wedded perimeter. Now, we still have to use the nomograph, though, ironically, is uh, we have to use the nomograph to find out the n that should be used in Manning's equation if it's not all the way full. Okay, so let's look at the nomograph here because we know that the ratio of depth to diameter is 0.375. That's what we had before. So 0.375 and then over to this curve, the Manning's end to end full curve, and then up to the top. And what I said was that the end to end full, I is end to end full is 1.27. And so then the n value that we use um, should be 0.013 if it is full. And the modified n value if it's not is 0 0.01651. So then in the end, we'll put it into Manning's equation with the actual area, the actual wetted perimeter, the n value that applies for partial full flow, and we get 3.78 feet. And so then, why is it different according to the two methods? Well, it's really because we were using this nomograph. And it's not that different, actually. The two different methods, 3.85 versus 3.78, that's a, a percent difference of just under 2%. So they agree relatively well, considering the fact that we were using this nomograph to try and find certain parameters that goes into the formula. But Partial flow hydraulics through a pipe, it's tricky. And uh, especially when you're doing the design and it's iterative design and you have to go back and forth several different times to find out what's the depth for a given flow rate, then you adjust the pipe diameter. So um, it's one of the challenges of designing in a, in a sewer is this partially full flow hydraulics. And it's one of the things that maybe those of you who are in um, in the hydrology class didn't appreciate that Stormcat is doing all of this in the in the background, kind of handling all the partially full flow hydraulic calculations. But uh, when we get together on Wednesday in the hydraulics lab, we'll pick back up with this uh, sewer design. We'll do a couple of examples where we're trying to figure out what's the required size of the pipe. Just remember that your last homework assume, assignment is due on Friday. And then we'll talk about the midterm exam in class on Wednesday. Uh, no, not the midterm, the final exam.